we would like to make one more operation uh, and apply it to both sides of the equation. We want to integrate the equation over the whole domain. So, well, uh, let it be omega again, gamma. So, we want to integrate over the whole domain, and I want to make it extremely clear. Well, I will not be writing the uh, integration elements d omega, d omega, d omega, because it will only obscure the, um, the notation. But I want to make it extremely clear that we are integrating over omega the whole domain, not just the, the subdomain of one of the elements. Okay, right now we need to make some adjustments. Uh, this term can be pretty nicely um, computed. Uh, this one also, however, we want to, well, I, I will explain in a minute why we want to get rid of this uh, second um, order derivatives, but just let me write it, well, for a minute, let me assume again that viscosity or diffusivity is constant. Uh, this means that we've got such a term And how can we write that? Well, basically, uh, quick re reminder, if we would write something like that, what does it give out of the multiplic multiplication? Let's apply the derivative to the first term. That's, well, something like that is the Laplacian times the second term, plus the first term times the derivative of the second term, right? Okay, so let's take this and put it here. Um, so we've got me, uh, and we can write, we want to have this, so this will be that minus that. So divergence of gradient of phi times v uh, minus um, gradient of phi, well, strictly speaking, I think it should be written like that. Forget it for a minute. Uh, omega. Okay, so far so good. Now, small change. How can we transform that? Mm -hmm. This one can be translated to integral over the whole domain not the boundary, uh, sorry, uh, of the whole boundary, not the boundary of the element, from n is gradient of u times v, right? Uh, and that one, we want to leave how it is. Uh, so our fine form formulation would be, uh, maybe let me write it uh, on the top. We've got the integral a times gradient of u times v equals equals that. Um, but okay, um, plus sign on the right hand side. Let's move it to the left hand side. If we move it to the left hand side then this one gives the plus sign. Sorry, me. 
Um, this one gives a negative sign, but let's move it to the right-hand side so it will be a uh, plus sign again. Equals, uh, this one is left. times u times v. Okay. Can I erase that? For a moment, for the sake of simplicity of the explanation, let me also write the one-dimensional form of that. Well, how would it look like? Uh, let's assume that we've got some domain that spans from zero to L. This would mean zero L A times D U D X times v plus ni zero to l gradient, uh, sorry, not gradient, du dx times dv dx equals integral from zero to l f times v plus, well, what, what is that? Good question in 1D. Exactly, it is like what, what is the boundary of a line segment? It's this point, this point, it's nothing else as evaluating the, the function ni, where n is nothing else that gives you either positive sign in the upper limit or negative sign in the lower limit. Uh, so it's nothing else like d u d x times v at x equal l minus d u d x times v at x equal zero. Sorry. Now, the, the most important discussion right now. First of all, what have we done? Can you see any advantages of the other formulation? No advantages. Exactly. One of the most important things is we did have the second derivatives in our original equation. Right now, we did get rid of second derivatives. The highest derivative that we've got in our problem are the first derivatives. And I think it's the most important, I think it's the most important advantage. Uh, the differential formulation that we've started with uh, is called the strong form or strong formulation. The one that we've arrived at is called the weak form or weak formulation. Why is it called weak? First of all, it's called weak because it doesn't require calculating second order derivatives. It only requires uh, calculating the first order der derivatives. It's one of the arguments why it's called weak formulation. But the other one is because we have multiplied the strong form, we have multiplied it by 
some function v and integrate it over the whole domain, which means we do not really require that the equation is fulfilled exactly at every location in the domain. We just require right now that the original equation times any arbitrary function and integrate it over the whole domain does fulfill this equality. Uh, how can you understand that? Like, and we will arrive at, in a minute what these V functions are. Is it something different than requiring that it holds for every location? Well, to be honest, not so much, because we say that you can select these functions completely arbitrarily, and this needs to hold, which means that, okay, if, I, if I'm thinking about this strong formulation, and for some reason I know that such a function is the correct solution, wherever you know that. Let's assume it's such a shape. You can say it, it represents one left or, or, or the right-hand side of the equation. Then what kind of function do you need in the strong formulation to satisfy that? Obviously, you need to have exactly the same function. Now, what do you need in the weak formulation? Well, if you, if you select V to be equal 1 everywhere, what would it mean? It means that, well, if you choose such a function, then, we, then the equation is already fulfilled, right? Because integrating the original function times v over the whole domain is exactly the same as taking this function times 1 and integrating over the whole domain, right? Yeah. But, but you can select v arbitrarily as you wish. So, and the equality must still hold. So, if this is fulfilled for v equal everywhere 1, then you can think of having, let's say, such a function that is 0, 0, 0, and only, and only tests whether the solution in a tiny interval here is the same. Well, maybe you can have some discrepancy, but already not much. And you can, you can choose as many functions as you wish. Maybe the other one would be shifted a bit. Maybe it would be wider. Maybe it would be well, thinner. So basically, you come back to the conclusion that this solution must be fulfilled for every place, but lowering the order of the derivatives is also has got one very important analogy in the physical problems that we are solving. For example, if you want to solve the heat conduction equation, and we had yesterday many, many problems with the fine volume discretization when we had two different materials or two different subdomains, and we needed to play around with that properly uh, to maintain the conserv conservativeness of the scheme. Uh, right now, you see that having two different materials of different conductivities and, and having such a kink in the gradient of the solution, well, if you select one find element to be here and the other find element to be here, what do you need to compute? You see, in the strong formulation, you required the second derivatives of u with respect to x exist. Here, it does not exist. Like the strong formulation is is inherently not able to, to, to treat 
things like that. If you reformulate it to the weak formulation, it turns out that the only thing that you require is that, that the first derivative exists. Well, and it, it exists here. It exists here. You've got some v functions that we didn't tell much what you require from the from these test functions, uh, but just believe me for a, for a while that you also require them having the the uh, first derivatives, and you've got everything in place, and with absolutely no tricks, it will work and it will work properly, even if you've got variable heat conductivities or diffusivities. Uh, so the weak formulation is you require less from your functions and you, and you define the equality by the product of two functions integrated over the whole domain, but you require this to be fulfilled for every function, well, from some function space that you select. Is it clear or questions? Okay, now some remarks. I, I did my best to show you how you check using these V functions whether the equality holds also locally. And these functions are called, mm -hmm, they are called test functions. These functions that are used to, to span the interpolation uh, within the area of one element are called the shape functions. Shape functions are used to interpolate the, the, um, the field that you're um, trying to solve for. Uh, test functions are used to test whether your solution holds well locally, globally. Uh, that's it. Mm. Well, I don't want to go into the theory what kind of function spaces you are using to, um, to, to select these test functions. Okay, I don't want to go into the theory what kind of space functions you are using to, um, to, for these test, test functions. Uh, let me state right now that in our applications we will need to have functions that, that have got their first derivatives uh, and the derivatives are limited. Uh, I mean, they are not infinite. Mm, and the last comment that I've got for today, I think, mm, is that at least throughout, throughout some part of our course, we will be saying that we are using the same functions in 1D case, in 1D linear case, for example, these functions. But for some part of the course, we will be using exactly the same functions for shape functions and test functions. And if test functions and shape functions are from the same function space, they're ex exactly the same, then we, we are calling such a discretization Galerkin find element method. Galerkin find element discretization means you're using ex exactly the same functions for shape functions and test functions. Then you can use different shape functions and different test functions, and we will go into the examples like that also. They're, they are needed to properly represent convective terms in, in fluid flows, in CFD, and then we will have non-Galerokin discretizations. <laughs>